Yes, now we are live. Uh, sorry for the brief delay. And welcome back to Rosa Luxemburg at 150, a two-day digital symposium hosted by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and the International Rosa Luxemburg Society. Uh, my name is Lauren. I'm an editor here at the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, and I'm kind of moderating uh, you through the conference today. Our next panel is on the topic of Rosa Luxemburg in Latin America. And we've got a great uh, lineup of speakers today. So I'll just go ahead and hand it over to our chair, Pablo. Oh, thank you, Lauren. Good afternoon to all the audience. Uh, I am now in Mar del Plata, Argentina. I'm one of the chairman of the International Rosa Luxemburg Society. And I have the honor of coordinating this panel entitled Rosa Luxemburg in Latin America. First, I would like uh, to say a few words to introduce us to the subject and then give way to the distinguished panelists who accompany me. In this sense, I think it's important to ask ourselves, why should we study the critical thinking of Rosa Luxemburg who died more than a hundred years ago? How important could be the ideas of someone who was hardly criticized by her contemporary party colleagues and ignored by sectors linked to communism throughout the 20th century? What has the influence of her thinking in our region, Latin America, been? If there is something that we should point out among her numerous qualities is the clarity with which she could apply Marxist and Engels' method, the dialectic materialism, in all her analysis. According to what Marx prescribed in his thesis about Feuerbach, Rosa was not satisfied with doing a theoretic study of reality. On the contrary, she always fought to change it. A tireless polemicist, she was one of the most brilliant minds that socialism produced after Marx's and Engels' deaths. Not only did she have a great knowledge of philosophy and politics, but her ability in the economic area led her to teach at the school of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. Nor did she shy away from the revolutionary struggle, which she paid for with jail repeatedly in her native Poland and Germany, and finally with her life. With honorable exceptions, even today, there are a few forums in which her ideas are rescued. Her work, I am convinced, is not the object of study that it deserves. I believe that in her indomitable spirit as a free thinker lies the answer to that ignorance to which her work and her figure were subjected since her physical disappearance. The thing is, Rosa Luxemburg never submitted to party discipline. She knew how to confront and harshly criticize her companion from the Second International when she considered that they defected in the defense of the principle of socialism, principles that she defended with her life, although never considered as dogmas, but subject to permanent critical analysis. Rosa argued with Bernstein and revisionists about the importance of the dialectical method, the validity of the theory of collapse, and the validity of the revolutionary principle among other issues. She confronted her friend Kowski when he, as party leader, took up in practice the reformist stance that she had criticized Bernstein so much. She harshly questioned the party's complicit silence in the face of the imperialist invasion of Germany in Morocco, a conduct that anticipated the behavior of the Second International in 1914, when its deputies would end up voting in favor of war credits. She debated with Lenin on subjects as different as the question of nationalities, the role of the party and the problems of the organization, or the importance assigned to the mass strike in the revolutionary struggle. Although she joyfully greeted and defended the 1917 revolution, she did not hesitate to criticize Lenin, Trotsky, and the Bolsheviks for the lack of freedom, the authoritarianism, and the dangers that this implied for the triumph of the socialist revolution. As a strong defender of the democratic system, Rosa pointed out with certainty that, I quote her, the heavy mechanism of democratic institutions has a powerful corrective precisely in the living moment of the masses in its uninterrupted expression. And the more democratic the institutions, the more vital and powerful the pulses of the political life of the masses are, the more direct and the total their effectiveness becomes in spite of the stagnant insignia of the party outdated electoral list, et cetera. It is true that every democratic institution has its limits and its absences, a fact that brings together all human institutions. But the remedy invaded by Trotsky and Lenin, the suppression of democracy in general, 
is even worse than the evil to be avoided. In effect, it suffocates the living source from which only corrections of congenital insufficiencies can arise to social institutions, an active, free and energetic political life of the broadest masses. And she added, it is a well-known and indisputable fact that without a free and untrammeled press, without the unlimited right of association and assembly, the dominance of the great popular masses is entirely unthinkable. Without general elections, without the free struggle of opinion in every public institution, life dies out and becomes a mere semblance of life in which only bureaucracy remains as the active element. That is why Rosa's constant critical interventions, both in the newspapers and in the party assemblies, generated hatred from those who should have been her fellow travelers. For the Bolsheviks, her questioning of the deters that the revolution was taken in Russia caused her writings to be, after Lenin's death, intentionally hidden. Rosa became a synonym for betrayal of the revolution, and her work was intentionally misrepresented. The arrival of Stalinism to power had a devastating effect on her memory. This is how Ruth Fischer, a disciple of Sinovi in Germany, pronounced a sentence that would become infamous among Rosa's detractors. She was responsible for having inoculated the syphilis virus in the KPD. In order to attack her, Rosa was ideologically associated with Trotsky, outlawed under Stalinism. On the other hand, within the social democracy, the works and the spirit of Rosa Luxemburg were too revolutionary. For all those leaders who embraced market socialism and to whom Bernstein's reading of Marxism seemed adequate and also very comfortable, lacked any interest to add the analysis of Rosa Luxemburg's work with her criticism of the bureaucracy of party and trade unions, her defense of the spontaneity of the masses, and even less with her interpretations about the collapse of the capitalist system and the harsh questioning of the imperialist policy followed by the central countries. Who was left to defend her? The sectors on the right, as expected, only took isolated sentences from her criticism of the Bolsheviks, ignoring the rest of her work. Only during the revolts in Hungary and Poland in 1956, and then in the Prague Spring and in the French May of 1968, did Rosa's work once again came back to be object of study and analysis, and her figure was vindicated. Unfortunately, they were only isolated episodes. The reception of her thought in Latin America has been very complex and with enormous differences depending on the country. Let's do a two examples. In Brazil, as Professor Isabel Loredo explains, Rosa thought had brilliant followers and interpreters, among which Mario Pedrosa, Paul Singer, and Michael Luby stand out. Thanks to them, Luxembourgism became a current with great influence in the Workers' Party, which governed the country between 2003 and 2016, and is a true mass party, and also in the MST, the social movement of enormous relevance. The situation has been very different in my country, Argentina, where her neglect is even more noticeable than in the rest of the region. The Centenary Socialist Party, founded in 1895, which knew how to have an, outst an outstanding influence in the first half of the 20th century, allowing the consecration of Alfredo Palacios as the first social socialist deputy in America in 1904, and becoming a government in several cities like Mar del Plata and Rosario, never took the ideas of Rosa Luxemburg. I think this was influenced by the fact that one of its founders and main figures, Dr. Juan B. Justo, author of the first translation of Marxist Capital to Spanish language, was always closer to Bernstein's revisionism than to Rosa's Marxism. And the same happened to the rest of the members of the party, which today is practically on the way to extinction. But I understand that another aspect that undermined the dissemination of her thought and cannot be forgotten is the terribly military dictatorship that devastated our country between the years 1976 and 1983. 1983. The identification of Marxism with subversion and terrorism occupied a central space in official discourse and practice in those years. The persecution and physical elimination of intellectuals, workers, and political activists, as well as the disappearance of everything that was related to Marxism from the academic curricula, penetrated very deeply in society as a whole. 
and fear is not easy to eradicate. I am convinced that Rosa Luxemburg thought is still alive and that her study, clarification and understanding, but above all, her critical analysis can be vital to build a theoretical framework that helps us to solve the problems that the society of the 20th century first of the 21st century presents us. Marxist socialism, socialism is not dead, and I consider it to be more alive than ever. And as Rosa so well affirmed in 1903, I quote her, if we discover a stop in our movement in what refers to all its theoretic applications, that is not because the theory on which it is based, Marxism, is unable to develop or is restricted. On the contrary, it is due to the fact that we have not learned to apply appropriately the most important intellectual weapons taken from Marxism by virtue of our pressing requirements in the first stages of our struggle. It is not true that in what refers to our practical fight, Marx has resigned or been overcome by us. In contrast, Marx in his scientific conception has gained distance as a fighter's political party. It is not true that Marx has stopped satisfying our needs. On the contrary, our needs still do not adequate themselves to the application of Marxist thoughts. Thank you. Now, let's move forward to our panelists. During their presentations, the audience can make questions and comments in the chat, and they will be answered during the debate. In first place, I'm glad to present Professor Dr. Tomas Barnagy. Tomas is Chair of School of Social and Political Theory at the Faculty of Social Sciences of the Universidad de Buenos Aires. He also holds the Chair of Philosophy of Law at the Universidad Nacional de la Matanza, Argentina. For 19 years, he taught seminars on Eastern Central European history and has been a researcher on classical and modern political philosophy, communism, Central and Eastern Europe, and political humor. For 16 years, he taught a politics course at the National Defense School and between 2015 and 2016, he served as organizer dean of the recently created Faculty of National Defense of Argentina. Author of numerous books, chapters, academic and journalist articles in Spanish, English, and Hungarian languages. Now, please, let's welcome Tomás and listen to his presentation entitled Rosa Luxemburg, a Central European Revolutionary. Please, Tomás. Thank you, Pablo, for your presentation. Thank you for the invitation. And let's, let's talk about Rosa Luxemburg. She's one of the most fascinating and imposing revolutionary figures in modern European history, and at the same time, one of the most discussed today. Her friends and adversaries emphasize the penetrating acuity of her intelligence, her great willpower, her lively and impatient temperament, her strong combative nature, and her great moral rigor. She was one of the main contributors to the most important Marxist theoretical newspaper of the time, the Neue Zeit. She even criticized the director, Karl Kautsky, considered the Pope of Marxism. In the revisionist controversy, Rosa Luxemburgo wrote Reform or Revolution, which is considered the best general Marxist response to the Second International to Reformism. Her position was that as long as capitalism lasted, its crisis and contradiction would not be softened. And to suggest something else, as Bernstein has suggested, was to break with the fundamental core of Marxism, denying the objective basis of the socialist project. Rosa intervened in the dispute between Lenin and the Menshevik at the Congress of 1903, criticizing the former for his conception of a highly centralized party vanguard. According to Luxembourg, it was an attempt to put the working class under tutelage. Her arguments, characteristic of all her work, were independent initiative, the workers' own activity, their ability to learn through their own experience and mistakes, and the need for a grassroots democratic organization. In Organization Problems of Social Democracy, 1904, Rosa Luxembourg, like Trotsky at that time, disagreed with Lenin that the party should be an organized organization of professional revolutionaries. On the contrary, she considered that the revolutionary party should encompass the working class organized as a whole. She did not underestimate the role of the party as a political leadership 
but denied its role as the daily organizer of the class struggle. And she said, she wrote, quote, let's speak clearly. Historically, the mistakes made by a truly revolutionary movement are infinitely more fruitful than the infallibility of the most cunning central committee. Even Leon Trotsky in a text written in 1904, contrary to the Leninist position, our political past, Trotsky prophesies and predicts in a famous paragraph that, quote, Lenin methods lead to this, the party organization replaces the party as a whole, then the central committee replaces the organization, finally a dictator replaces the central committee. But Trotsky, years later, dismissed himself by stating, quote, all subsequent experience has shown me that Lenin was right against Rosa Luxemburg and against me. Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg had a common response to the 1905 revolution. Both of them considered necessary a bourgeois revolution in Russia, carried out under the leadership and with the methods of the struggle of the proletariat. She considered that the mass actions of the Russian workers would be of international importance. In her work, Strike of the Masses, Party and Unions, 1906, she proposed a general strike as the form par excellence of the proletarian revolution. The mass strike was a spontaneous expression of the creative power of the masses, the elemental form of the revolution, and an antidote to bureaucratic inertia, uniting political and economic struggle, and together with far-reaching demands, could become a potential challenge for the capitalist order. She attacked German militarism and imperialism when there was a possibility of war which could be avoided with a general strike that would unite all the workers, which Kautsky opposed. Rosa broke with him in 1910, as he defended a cautious, purely electoralist policy on the part of the party, which had become a conservative party and a reformist apparatus. As a representative of the Social Democrat Party, Rosa went to the European Socialist Congresses and in Paris in 1912, she and the French socialist Jean Jaurès proposed that in the event of war breaking out, the worker parties of Europe should declare a general strike. She wrote in 1913 her most important theoretical work, The Accumulation of Capital, which is one of her most original contributions to Marxist economic doctrine. She argues that imperialism was the result of a competitive struggle between capitalist nation or what was left in the non-capitalist world that when eroded shook capitalist relations and caused the inevitable collapse of the system. In 1914, only one deputy in Germany did not submit to party discipline. That was Karl Liebknecht, the only vote against the war credits. The intellectual defenders of the revolutionary internationalism, Luxembourg, Liebknecht, Frank Smerin and Clara Zetkin met in the Spartacus League, denouncing in their Unish pamphlet and other writings the patriotic and nationalist position of the Social Democracy Party as a betrayer. Later, Rosa wrote the Russian Revolution in solidarity and as an expression of sympathy towards Lenin, Trotsky, and the Bolsheviks, and in support of their attempt at a socialist revolution. Although she retained a critical attitude toward his policy on land and nationality over and above his restriction on the socialist democracy, she did not support the belief of the indiscriminate acceptance of everything that the Bolsheviks did in the name of the labor movement. While praising the October Revolution, Rosa believed that an unqualified endorsement of everything that Bolshevik did would be of no real use. She criticized the Bolsheviks in power in the following aspect, the agrarian question, the question of nationality, the constituent assembly, and the democratic rights of the workers. Luxembourg's main criticism of the Bolsheviks is that they were responsible for restricting and undermining workers' democracy. And the tragic history of the Soviet Union pro proves that it was prophetically correct. She had the conviction that workers' democracy is inseparable from the proletarian revolution and socialism. She wrote in the Russian Revolution, quote, yes, 
dictatorship of the proletariat. But these dictatorships consist in the way to apply democracy, not in its elimination. This dictatorship must be the work of the class and not of a small managerial minority in the name of the class. Rosa predicted with surprising clarity what would happen in the Soviet Union in a critique of the Bolshevik party that is in the best tradition of Marxism on the basic axiom of Marx, that is the ruthless critique of everything that exists. Without the broadest workers' democracy, quote, socialism will be decreed from a few official offices by a dozen intellectuals with the repression of political activity throughout the land, without general elections, without un unrestricted freedom of the press and assembly, without a free confrontation of opinion, life dies in every public institution. It becomes a mere appearance of life in which only the bureaucracy remains as an active element. It was in this context that she wrote her famous, frequently quoted phrase, Freiheit is immer de Freiheit des Anders denken denn. Freedom is always freedom for those who think differently. There is a great misinformation about Rosa Luxemburgo and among the reasons for the insufficient levels of research is the lack of publication of her letters and writings, especially in the Spanish language, although this has changed a lot in the past years. Regarding the interpretations, we can distinguish three fundamental directions. The first considers that basically there was no instrumental opposition between Lenin and Luxembourg. The second dominant in the Soviet bloc regarded her as a genius leader of the German proletariat, but all ideas that do not coincide with Lenin were rejected. Jörg Lukács, the Hungarian, and Nikolai Bukharin criticized erroneous theories in the 1920s. And finally, Joseph Stalin, in his Problems of History of Bolshevism, considered that Rosa Luxemburg, <coughs> excuse me, built an utopian and semi-Menshevik system that led to the permanent revolution, accusing her of being a Trotskyist. <clears throat> the third interpretation is that Rosa was not only an exemplary personality, but also the true creator of democratic communism, opposed both to Marxist-Leninist dogmatism and to social democratic opportunism, a truly Marxist and human socialism which surpassed undemocratic communism and to no socialist bourgeois democracy in a third way towards the authentic realization of socialist democracy. Among the most prominent representative of this later orientation were Karl Korsch, Robert Havemann, Alexander Dubček, Leszek Kolakowski, and the whole new left that vindicates the life and work of Rosa Luxemburgo in the 1960s and 1970s and today. Undoubtedly, its historical significance at the beginning of the 20th century consisted in having collaborated in the renewal of Marxism independently of Lenin and without his tendency to a dogmatic monism that led to the unfortunate consequences of Stalinism. Franz Mehring, Marx biographer, was not exaggerating when he considered Rosa Luxemburg the best brain after Marx. But she not only brought her brain to the working class movement, she gave everything she had, her heart, her passion, her strong will, her life. Rosa was, above all, a revolutionary socialist, a tireless, overwhelming, and an exceptionally effective agitator. As her close friend Clara Zetkin, expressed at her funeral. The main task and dominant ambition, I'm quoting Clara Zetkin at her funeral farewell, the main task and dominant ambition of this amazing woman was to prepare the way for the social revolution, to clear the path of history for socialism. Her greatest happiness was experiencing the revolution, fighting in all its battles. She consecrated her entire life and her entire being to socialism with a will, determination, detachment, and fervor that cannot be expressed in words. She gave herself fully to the cause of socialism, 
not only with the tragic death, but through how their entire life, daily and every minute, through the struggles of many years, she was the sharp sword, the living flame of the revolution. And finally, Bertolt Brecht wore, wrote the following epitaph for Rosa Luxemburg. Now the red rose has also disappeared. She told the poor about life, and so the rich have erased it. May she rest, rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas, for your excellent intervention. Now I'm glad to introduce Marina Cabat, professor. Marina is a researcher at the National Council for Scientific and Technological Research, CONICET, and a college professor at the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. She is a specialist in labor and industrial studies who has focused on the work organization, labor conflicts, and collective labor agreements. She has also studied the contemporary unemployment and taking factories movements in Argentina. Since 1995, Marina edits the Marxist journal Razón y Revolución, and she has directed the edition of the book Luxemburgo Rosa, Espontanidad y Acción, Debates sobre la Huelga de Masas, la Revolución y el Partido in 2015. She has also published academic papers regarding Luxembourg political thought and has participated in political debates regarding Rosa Luxemburg's legacy with the main reference of Argentina left parties. Now, please, let's welcome Marina and listen her presentation entitled Rosa Luxemburg, the mass strike debate and its implication to our, our understanding of contemporary labor unrest and political dynamic in Latin America. Please, Marina. Thank you, Pablo. I'm very glad to be here today in this conference to talk about Luxembourg's contribution to the mass strike debate and its consequence to uh, sink Latin American politics uh, nowadays. First of all, we have to frame Luxembourg's contribution in her background context. At the end of 19th century, slow parliamentary advance were considered the only possible path towards socialism. These tactics allegedly had Engels' blessings. Now we know it wasn't true, but uh, contemporary thinkers thought so. Thus, to uh, question the parliamentary tactics of social democracy meant in the mind of contemporary people to challenge Engels' opinions. Slowly, in the left wing of social democracy, an alternative tactic emerged. First, in a quite embryonic form, when, among others, Luxembourg started campaigning for the use of mass strikes as a means to conquer or defend universal suffrage. Thus, at first, this uh, new tactic in reality, it was just a complement to parliamentary tactics. However, Luxembourg and other comrades already glimpsed the possibility of going beyond, especially in the case that we shall see flatly rejected universal suffrage. Luxembourg participation in 1905 Russian Revolution reinforce her confidence in mass action. And uh, under this inspiration, she wrote her famous leaflet about mass tracks. While even the more progressive social democrats in Siena Congress still thought of mass strike only as a single and peaceful act disconnected from any other political action, for instance, they rejected the idea of solidarity strikes. For, uh, for Rosa Luxemburg, mass strikes is the form of revolutionary struggle, the movement of proletarian masses and the form in which their struggle manifests in revolutions. Thus, she confronts all prejudices regarding conflicts held by unorganized workers. 
Luxembourg shows how these groups manage to tri triumph and how a successful strike could give rise to a new union. We consider that Luxembourg concern for the involvement of all proletarian layers in class struggles and her concern for their political unity has today even more importance than it has in her times. Today, working class is fragmented, it's fractured between the employed and the unemployed. And between the employed workers, there's still a division among former workers and precarious ones. In Latin America, left political parties still tend to reproduce some of the old mistakes of the Sherman social democracy. They fluctuate between parliamentarism and corporativism, and they tend to privilege actions among the occupied working class, especially blue collar workers regardless that they are now a minority and they not, uh, do not um, form part now of uh, the political vanguard. In their place, other fractions of the working class, state workers, teachers, doctors, social workers, the unemployed and uh, precarious fractions of the working class have shown greater dynamism. At this point, it's worth remember, remembering Luxembourg's lessons that the most institutionalized fraction of the working class are not always the more dynamic in a revolutionary process. In second place, it's worth remembering, remembering Luxembourg's fight against a religious reading, a religious conception of Marxism. Luxembourg's ability to question what was considered the old and proven tactics of social democracy is, is an attitude to be recovered today. However, in order to follow her critical approach, we should not embrace a different dogma, one that in the name of criticizing Marxist dogmatic versions, sinks in postmodern dogmatism. Postmodern dogmatism denies the core beliefs of Rosa Luxemburg, that is, the belief in the real possibility of a positive knowledge of reality. Marxism as a science and social revolution as a goal. From a postmodern perspective, Luxembourg has been presented as a source of inspiration for social movements and for agrarian reform projects in Latin America. I do not agree with this I do not have time to explain why, but you can read it in my paper. Even more problematic is the attempt to use Luxembourg's text to advocate for the so-called 21st century socialist governments. This characterization of Venezuelan governments it's not grounded in an analysis of its political, its politics, which in ultimate case, that doesn't go beyond uh, of bourgeois nationalism. Rather, this, uh, uh, this is just an ideological attempt to justify these governments to legitimize this government. Chavism in Venezuela, like other similar governments of the regions, is a monopartist government. 
Bonapartist governments emerged here as a consequence of a relative tide in between confronted social forces. Their goal isn't to boost their rev revolutionary potential of the masses, but to contain it. To fulfill this goal, Bonapartist governments at first have a radical discourse and some concessions to the working masses are made. However, once well established in power, Bonapartist governments shift to the right and apply austerity measures. These economic measures generate discontent among the proletarian masses. This discontent is handled in different form by different governments. For instance, the PT, the Lula's parties in Brazil and Kirchnerism in Argentina both lose some elections. But, but Chavism managed to stay in power by reinforcing its authoritarianism. We see now demonstrations against the Venezuelan government carried out by the same people that previously, previously had supported Chavism. And these demonstrations are being repressed by police paramilitia forces, like the fires, the special action forces. In Venezuela, there's no freedom to negotiate collective labor agreements. And some political leaders, social leaders, union leaders have been in force disappeared, murdered, or been imprisoned. Like Rodney Alvarez, union leader is. Rodney Alvarez, is a union leader from Ferromineira industry that has spent the last nine years in jail without any court sentence. His trial doesn't advance, his trial doesn't progress because the government, government slows it down. The government hasn't got any proof against Rodney Alvarez and it's just bureaucratically keeping him in jail by this way. Boron and Harnecker, Attilio Boron and Marta Harnecker, have been Chavez's main defenders. Both have turned to Luxembourg's test to justify their positions. Marta Harnecker, in one hand, quotes quotes Luxembourg text to claim that socialism past is not laid out beforehand and that Venezuelan past could be a possible one. However, the repression of socialist leaders and organization is never a possible path towards socialism, much the less one that Luxembourg would have supported. Boron, on the other hand, Attilio Boron, have, has quoted Luxembourg's critics to the lack of democracy in a Bolshevik Russian revolution to, in contrast, vindicate Venezuelan model. However, Boron hasn't turned to Luxembourg to denounce the absence of democratic practice in Venezuela, or the repression of socialist leaders, or the proscription of political parties just because they have the word socialist in their name. In the region and outside it, there have been doubts regarding if it was timely to denounce Chavism and other Bonapartist regimes in fear of the growth of the right politicians. But if 
in some Latin American country, white politicians have, have grown, that is simply because the left was incapable of benefiting from Bonapartist crisis because it has turned their back to the proletarian masses that were protesting against uh, economic measures from these Bonapartist governments. So, if you agree with me, yeah, and if you agree especially with Rosa Luxemburg that shouting out the, tr the truth is a revolutionary act, then I ask all of you to inform yourself, to learn about who Rodney Alvarez is, to learn about the activities of the International, International Committee of Solidarity with the persecuted workers in Venezuela, and to join our campaign to free Rodney Alvarez. I tell you this plainly. If Rosa Luxemburg lived today in Venezuela, luckily she will be in Shen. Otherwise, she will be murdered or disappear like Alcedo Mora. Only criticizing national bourgeoisie governments rather than aligning with them, the revolutionary left can grow. Only then, the dream of the socialist state of Latin America could be could transform in a reality. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Marina, for exposition. Uh, now I'm glad to present Professor Juliana Tumini. Juliana is a feminist lawyer and doctor of law from the Faculty of Law of Universidad Nacional de Mar del Plata. She serves as a teacher in the chairs of political law and general theory of law in the same House of Studies in Argentina. In her development as a teacher, she has published chair text and has obtained the degree of specialist in university teaching. She's a member of the Human Rights Center of Teaching and Research, Dr. Alicia Moreau. She has participated in different research projects, has published articles and chapters of books, and is currently co-director of the research project, The Right to the City as a Human Right, producing space to build spatial justice. Now, please, let's welcome Juliana and Lisa her presentation entitled the role of the right to the city as an instrument of revolution in Latin America, a look from Rosa Luxemburg's legacy. Please, Juliana, we hear you. Thank you, Pablo. I am very glad to be here. Uh, hello, everybody. I start uh, with a quote of Rosa Luxemburg, who says, in reform or revolution, democracy is essential for the working class because only the exercise of its democratic democratic rights in the fight for democracy, can the proletariat become aware of its class interest and of a historical task. In recent years, Marxist studies have had an interesting drift as they orient them themselves towards the geographical and spatial aspects of the capitalist mode of production. In particular, developments around the right of, to the city have offered illuminating tools for the current fight against capitalism. This approach is relevant in Latin America, which is characterized by a structural housing deficit and by re-hosting the disadvantaged in poor habitats, marked by environmental problems, lack of public services, and restricted accessibility to civic, social, and cultural spaces. In parallel, there are continuous advances in capital over public spaces. To this, we must add that we are in the presence of the most urbanized region on the planet, with more than 75 of the population living in cities, a percentage that in Argentina exceeds 92%. The most vigorous struggles have been in the cities, as witnessed by two recent examples the claims in Chile that led to constitutional reform 
and the feminist struggle for the right to voluntary termination of pregnancy in Argentina, a sign that it is the city, in the words of Lefebvre and Harvey, the space in which the class struggle takes place. The movements that claim for their rights for an extension of democracy are heterogeneous, and their claims are not presented as, as disruptors, but rather stressing institutional structures demanding within the framework of legal norms an extension of rights and democracy. However, despite significant progress resulting from social movements and popular governments that have realized some of their claims, there has been reverse political reactions in the region led by governments, some chosen under the rules of the democratic system and other forcing institution. Balance remains unequal societies, and it is in cities where the consequences of capitalism appear most brazenly. The pandemic only cruelly revealed the effect that poor habitat has on the quality of life of the disadvantaged, especially women, who are more strongly impacted by economic crisis. Here, I will try to make a reading of the possibilities and limits of the right to the city as a tool of transformation based on the reflections that Rosa Luxemburg bequeathed to us in her understanding of the dialectical relationship between reform and revolution, as well as her unrestricted defense of democracy. The questions that guide me suggest thinking from Rosa's conceptual framework, whether the right to the city established through social, political, and legal claims can be a way for social transformation and what its limits are within the framework of capitalism in its current phase. In particular, the implications of her refusal to set aside the struggle for an end of capitalism, as well as her understanding of the value of democracy not subsumable to other purposes or as a mere instrument, but at the same time attentive not to fall into an abstract and a historical notion, but to be aware of the limits of its transformative capacity within the framework of the capitalist system. David Harvey claims that we are the cities in which we live and encourages us to ask ourselves if these fragmented cities where rich areas coexist with others sunk in the mud are those in which we want to live and whether these spaces represent what we want to be and whether they express the relationships we have with nature. In his questioning, we can remember the formulations, utopian and not so much, that other thinkers have made throughout history to shake common sense and the naturalization of soci social injustices. However, his reflections is not abstract. It is an answer to the description of what our neoliberal cities are indeed like. The result of the need to reinvest the surplus capital. As Slavin argues, the results of neoliberalism production of space are dual cities fragmented with countless slums. Latin America is the most urbanized region on the planet. And in Argentina, we are 93% the ones who inhabit the cities. But the housing and habitat deficit is a structural pro problem. In Latin America, there are more than 110 million people living in squalor villages, which makes up more than 25% of its population. The sharpest criticism of the conception of the right to the city is to take it as a harmless reformism in capitalism, which could result in a strengthening of the system instead of the beginning of revolutionary transformation. For this reason, Rusa's reflection between reform or revolution can be resumed to think about whether the city represents a space for class struggle or whether the insistence on the right to the city as a tool of transformation comes down to serving as reform within capitalism. In this sense is Garnier of Shakespeare who wonders, and I, I uh, quote him, what is the point of then returning to a radical critical thinking of the urban 
if it has no impact on the social reality of the city? Why we criticize capitalist urbanization if this does not lead to effective questioning, that is to say in the facts and not only in the words of the social system produced by this urbanization. End of the quote. He requires that we think about how to move from theorizations to realizations. Luxembourg's dialectical perspective allowed her to affirm that the difference and tension between reform and revolution, which involved the combination of the struggle for the improvement of working class living conditions with the strategic emancipation project should not become a dichotomous distinction. In the same sense, we can argue that some transformations promote and carry out from the right to the city should not be seen as antagonistic to the possibility of revolutionary change. She was convinced that it was not possible to carry out the transition to socialism without, and I quote her, the masses receiving a very intensive political education and accumulating experiences, end of the quote. Something unthinkable without democratic freedoms. By polemizing with Marstein, who she called opportunistic, who argued that democracy could make revolution unnecessary, Rosa did not fall into economic determinist, but from a dialectical perspective, she affirmed both the need to take advantage of certain institutions of democracy for transformation and especially for the political formation of the working class and the imperative of not abandoning the ultimate goal also of socialism, ending the division of society into classes. Although thorough her, her work, Rosa did not cease to remember the essentials of democracy to sustain freedom of thought and avoid fossilizing bureaucracy, she was lucid to warn that what Bernstein called democracy was nothing more than a historical version tied to capitalism and not an eternal model. So conceiving the right to the city as an instance on the road to transforming the system does not seem to disalent with the position of the Polish thinker. The struggles for the different rights that make up the right to the city can operate as a forming of critical awareness, capacity for transformation and emancipation. In Harvey's view, what is relevant is the meaning attribute to the significant emptiness of the right to the city, which can be used in a simple reformist and innocuous way or be conceived of as a revolutionary notion. It admits, however, the difficulties involved in distinguishing between reformist and revolutionary proposals. On the other hand, it is necessary to broaden our gaze on who will carry out the transformation, and in this case, for whom and whose the right to the city is. As Obinia states, the construction of disputes over the right to the city, which expand the revolutionary subject, seems to respond to the characteristics of contemporary claims, which do not stick to contesting capitalism and its class, its class exploitation, but are conceived in terms of the dispute to patriarchy, environmental damage, among others. If Rosa conceived revolution from and for everyday life, access to housing and urban infrastructure, as well as to participatory democracy, seems to be conditions for subjects to become aware, think and carry out systematic and revolutionary transformation. Living in conditions of mere survival does not allow, allow us to think of a horizon farther away than daily life. Therefore, there are some motorized struggles for the right to the city, such as access to an adequate habitat that propose emancipation. Other transformations such as expanding public spaces for recreation or, or building restrooms in squares perhaps are safe reforms for capitalism. The distinction Harvey will say may not be easy. However, to think that the urban changes that make life in the city fairer are an obstacle to deeper transformations seems to throw us to paralyzing and pity conclusion. 
that of believing that pauperization and worsening or not improving the lives of workers is unavoidable for revolution. It is not desirable to fall into an idealistic vision in moral terms of a Kantian type, but also not to defend a practice that involves refusing to limit the suffering of many, thinking of ensuring a better future. Rosa Luxemburg's legacy seems to offer us an interesting key. Let us fight for the right to the city. Let us try reforms within the framework of capitalism, but without losing sight of the ultimate goal of transforming the capitalist system. For this to be possible, it's essential not only to improve living conditions, but to expand the instances of political participation and democratic education. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you, Juliana, for your presentation. And now I'm glad to introduce Professor Rosa Rosa Gomez. Rosa is graduated in history and has a master's degree in economic history, both at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. She studied Luxembourg's book, The Accumulation of Capital, and her master was published in 2018 under the title Rosa Luxembourg, Crisis and Revolution. She is a member of G. Marx, a group at the University of Sao Paulo, coordinated by Professor Lincoln Seco. In this group, Rosa takes part in the editorial work. She is part of another group that teaches political economy and Brazilian history courses, and also takes part in a project to build a heritage center for the workers of the district called Perus in Sao Paulo. Now, please, let's welcome Rosa and listen to her presentation entitled An Analysis of Brazilian Left from Luxembourg's Point of View. Please, we hear you, Rosa. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you, Pablo. Uh, so I'll talk about the Works Party, Partido dos Trabalhadores, known as PT in Brazil, and its development and the recent events in Brazil in light of some of Luxembourg's ideas. First, I would like to stress Brazil's place in the international division of labor, following Luxembourg's accumulation theory. What is known today as Brazil has been through all the phases of accumulation mentioned by Luxembourg in her book. The struggle against natural economy, the introduction of commodity economy, the struggle against peasant economy, and imperialism with all its methods of exploitation. Even after the political independence in 1822, Brazil kept its subdued position in international affairs, responding to other countries and people's interests. It is until today a country prone to opening frontiers to capital accumulation, not only as a commodity producer, but in the sense that the accumulation process described by Luxembourg still happens. The projects that wanted to change Brazil's place in the international division of labor were finally defeated in 1964 with a military coup and a subsequent dictatorship. The Workers' Party, PT, is in Brazil was founded in 1980 as an assembly of different movements that fought this dictatorship and the, the dreadful social economic situation caused by this region to the working class. Thus, the party was founded as a result of this self-consciousness and at first organized bottom up as a federation of small groups. The base structures had more power in the beginning. As a result of its development and the class struggles in Brazil from the 1980s to 2000, the party underwent so many changes. By the time PT finally won the presidential election in Brazil in 2002, 22 years after its foundation, it was a completely different party, a centralized one. The organization had chosen the conciliation strategy and made lots of agreements with the conservative sector of Brazilian politics. It ruled from 2003 until 2016 
winning four elections until they were overthrown. It was a period of growth, of growth for the Brazilian economy that was surely related to the rise of commodities prices in the international market, but it is also true that any other government would have kept this extra money and distributed it among the upper classes. The debates around the reduction of social inequality are still going on in Brazil, but a perceptive improvement in the lives of the poorest during PT's presidential terms is undeniable. And so is the shaking of the Brazilian social structure. The global crisis of 2008 has also had an impact on Brazil. But at first, PT government took some anti-cyclical measures, such as reducing taxes over industrialized products to improve demand, creating a program to finance housing for low-income families, maintaining cash transfer programs, such as uh, Bolsa Familia, and trying to reduce the interest rate, rate. But these policies were limited and the average monthly income started to decrease in 2014 and the deindustrialization process went on. During this year of 2014, there were presidential elections, the, the hosting of a World Cup in Brazil and lots of protests is still ongoing. In 2013, riots were initiated because of the increase of bus fares and were manipulated months later by the media that transformed them into a nonsensical matter, awakening the worst in the middle and upper classes. The presidential elections of 2014 were ideological, maybe the most ideological since 1989. Dilma Rousseff from PT was re-elected with a program of anti-psychical economic politics. People elected PT so the country would face the economic crisis by taxing employers and riches and redistributing money to people to keep the economy running. Well, Dilma applied the opposite program, the one that had lost in the ballots. The media kept inflating the worst in people and as a result of our reactionary forces and PT's political decisions, Dilma's impeachment happened. During the years in power, PT disrupted mass organizations. It became a bureaucratic party and called its followers only during the ballots. Even today, in a situation where the party is ignored and persecuted by the ruling class and its apparatus, the direction of the party worries only with next elections and possible agreements with bourgeois groups to supposedly avoid a greater evil. While these discussions go on, the party is being neutralized and the population is paying the price of the global crisis and the need of capital to accumulate. This reveals that until this day, the party hasn't formulated a clear understanding about governing Brazil and its middle classes. Even worse, it doesn't seem to have an understanding about class struggle at all. Middle classes in capitalist societies are always looking up to the class above them, even though their material life and social relations are much more like the working classes. As for the ruling class, its only goal is to enlarge its own profit no matter what it takes. Putting these abstract characterizations of both classes in a context of a country that hasn't resolved itself with its past of slavery is the way to understand the specific colors of Brazilian class struggle, which means that upper classes still consider the poorest as lesser humans. In this context, in spite of any agreements made, the ruling class will do anything to hang on to power, to keep all the profits to itself, to avoid sharing. It will even make agreements with fascists. If we compare the Workers' Party in Brazil with the German social democracy during Luxembourg's lifetime, it is necessary to point out some differences. PT was a popular party formed, and it still is actually, 
formed by the gathering of lots of popular movements in a huge territory with enormous social and economic differences in a peripheral country. German social democracy was formed by the merging of two other organizations with different lines of thought, from Marx and Lasalle, and despite, despite that, it had a declared socialist goal. Germany was not as big as Brazil, though it was bigger than it is today, and most importantly, it was an imperialist country at the top of the global economy, disputing with England and in the United States. Despite these differences, both social democracies have some proximity in their histories. Eric Hobsbawm says that the Workers' Party in Brazil in 2002 was a phenomenon of global importance for the Red Hearts and compares it to the mass parties that merged in Europe by the turn of the 20th century. The Brazilian historian Lincoln Seco analyzed the similarities, also analyzed the similarities and differences between both organizations. One way or another, it is important to state that PT didn't kill its major leaders, but it led them to be imprisoned and destroyed as public figures by the Lava Jato, a political process that used non-proved accusations as to persecute the Workers' Party and that has been exposed by the Intercept Brazil, revealing a major scandal in Brazilian justice system. As a result of this process, the bourgeoisie finally succeeded in overthrowing the workers' organization in Brazil from the government. And to do so, it made every effort necessary, aligning itself with the most experienced layers of Brazilian politics to a point that it is almost losing control if it hasn't already. already. Even with all the problems, PT is still a great force among the people. A significant part of Brazilian working class identifies PT as its organization. Are we stuck with this party? Communists and workers are stuck with the working class. Rosa Luxemburg's life expresses that. She dedicated her life to fight to spread the revolution throughout the working masses. Luxembourg fiercely criticized the opportunists in her party who were concerned only with elections, political positions, and political influence inside the boundaries of bourgeois society. For years, she has warned about the risk of making alliances with the bourgeoisie and conciliation politics. She has warned over and over again about the necessity of the party as an organization of the working class to achieve a precise idea of imperialism and the role of militarism and the capitalist state in accumulation. For Luxembourg, at some point, German social democracy started believing in the bourgeois discourse based on a false idea of nationalism. Later, when German re revolution was in process, Ger German social democratic leaders believed that they had made a deal and would share the power with the bourgeoisie. Luxembourg has also warned the so social democracy leaders that they would be kept in power only for as long as the bourgeoisie thought it was necessary. What happened later was the rise of fascist movements all over the world, and what is happening today resembles those years. Look into the Brazilian experience with PT through these lenses, some points stand out. Above all, the na naivety of the party's leadership regarding the conciliation strategy. In Brazil, the reformism applied by PT was enough to infuriate the ruling and middle classes, particularly when the crisis got worse. To improve the workers' life is the basic duty of a workers' party, but it is lack of class consciousness to believe that this is the way to assure a more equal society or a fair one. 
This becomes more evident with the weakening of workers' organizations that were taken aback and couldn't react properly when the media and its supporters started attacking all social conquests made in the 13 years of PT administration and going forth, forth over former social rights. Today, fascism is in the ascendant and the way to keep it from becoming a regime and to escape the barbarism that engulfs us daily is to emphasize the class struggle. As wrote Alan Badiou recently in a text public in Brazil, not necessarily using the storm, but questioning the exploitation, the private appropriation of social product, escaping naive arguments and easy paths. It is time to look closely to many things Luxembourg wrote about, land grabbing, capital accumulation, militarism, state, proletarian organization, and not to lose sight of her quote from 1915-1916. We are not lost and we will be victors if we have not learned how to learn. And, with the pre and if the present leaders of the proletariat, the social democrats, do not understand how to learn, then they will go under to make room for people capable of dealing with a new world. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Rosa, very much. And now we it's time to have a brief debate about the recent presentations. I will read some of the questions and comments we receive on the, by the chat. First, for Marina, if you want to make a brief commentary about Bolivarianism, that it appears as a comment. Well, Bolivarianism is a name uh, associated with Chavism, that Chavism show, uh, chose to present itself. Uh, that as, as, associates uh, Chavism with Latin American political and economical uh, independence and uh, with their uh, anti-imperialist politics because uh, it relates to Bolivar, the, uh, the fighter for the ind first independence of Latin American countries. But it's... Uh, much a rhetorical uh, gesture, uh, a rhetorical posture, because uh, in Venezuela, um, despite this Bolivarian, uh, Bolivarianism and alleged uh, anti-imperialism, there had been a very intense uh, international trade with, interna with uh, the US uh, also. And uh, despite uh, many people talks about the uh, Venezuelan economic lock lockdown, the truth is uh, the international trade has been very intense and it has only slowed down um, for a short time and more, uh, more than related to a political decisions uh, from the U.S. or other countries, uh, the economic crisis in Venezuela is more related to um, the fall in petroleum prices and uh, the fall of uh, the trade with the United States, not for a political decision, but because the United States has increased its pro petroleum production uh, in a great um, uh, uh, in a great manner associated with fracking a new procedure of production and thus uh, US doesn't need Venezuelan pro, uh, petroleum the way it needed before. But um, Venezuelan government had a very anti-imperialist rhetoric while on the other hand, uh, international trade just continue uh, in the same manner that always did. 
when the price are up, the, the price are up, when the price are uh, fall, the price fall, but there was no, there was no structural change, not in the uh, uh, property structure of uh, the economy, private uh, economy still exists, uh, eco private econ uh, enterprises have not been expropriated, even in petroleum activity, there are uh, private firms that work together with the state company. So um, it was now a rhetorical, um, uh, a rhetorical way to conquer uh, international support, to silence critics. Uh, it's not the first time that in Latin America, uh, working class has been repressed uh, by governments that have a highly anti-imperialist rhetoric. The, in Argentina, we have the case of Peronism, which uh, was very repressive with the working class, with the left, with the Communist Party, with, with the communist leader, and with the new uh, left that emerged in the 70s. And uh, it did, uh, it carried on this repression with a very anti-imperialistic rhetoric. And that was just a rhetoric, some, some, something that uh, uh, for uh, the government is useful to justify uh, his, uh, his staying in power and to justify and silence the critics for uh, its repression towards uh, the working class. I would like to say in my opinion, in Venezuela, it's not the left, in my opinion. It's not a workers' party. It's somebody who takes the power. It's not bureaucratization. It's a clique which took power for their own benefits. It's a Bolivarian bourgeoisie. It's a body bourgeoisie. And there are strong and gross violations of human rights in Venezuela. And there is almost 5 million people who left Venezuela. Who can talk about human rights in Venezuela? Well, that's my opinion. And Venezuela is a very interesting subject. And we have many, many to discuss about it. Also, like about Peronism, I think, because it's difficult for people who live in Argentina to explain about Peronism and what Peronism is. Peronism is right, left, Peronism is right. There are many, many Peronism. But well, I, I pass to another question. I have one question for Marina. Uh, someone comment in the chat. How could be the society so unfair with the PT government? Can you add something about this? Well, the PT government. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, Marina. Oh. I confuse it. It's, it's to Rosa, Rosa. please. <laughs> Excuse me, it's Brazil. Brazil sector. Sorry. It's my fault. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think we should not address the, the problems in a moral way. It's not it's not a question of unfair unfairness or fairness. I think what happened with PT is a result of class struggle, mostly. So at some point, the bourgeoisie wanted not to share anymore and, and the necessities to uh, get exploitation wars. That's not really what I mean, but uh, the, necess the necessities of capital, the global capital to increase the profits rates and therefore the necessity to increase exploitation. This all had to do with the overthrow of PT's government. And with that, the media played a major role. So I think that's also something that we must always uh, have in mind. The, major propaganda that has been done since 2005 actually against the party and in 2014 if you would look to the data all the economic data from brazil are getting really worse the 
the unemployment rates go up actually in 2015 it starts really going up and the part and with this uh, offensive of the bourgeoisie uh, over the party the direction didn't took uh, a strategy to fight it back in a left way the strategy was more like trying to calm down the bourgeoisie. So I, I don't think that society wasn't fair to PT. It was a mix of all the situations. Like people was weren't not uh, happy to with the economic situations. The wages were not going up. So uh, campaigning the prices. Uh, uh, the rate the wages were not going up as much as the prices were so in actually people were start uh, earning less in real life <laughs> sorry and uh and that's the problem of the development of the party itself also that it stopped doing um uh, this work in in the bottom of the party and start more acting only in the electoral process, much like what happened with SPD, actually, more or less. I'll, I'll stop here. Oh, Sorry. Yes. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, we have no much time to speak. I we have only one or two minutes. I uh, want to read the, the last commentary that I received in I think it's very interesting. They said in the chat, a general question for all speakers. In Brazil and Venezuela, bureaucratization seems to have afflicted the left as soon as it took power. As we also the case, as was also the case for the European parties before them. Does this not suggest that such bureaucratization is an inevitable part of workers' party taking power? And if so, can these tendencies be combated? I don't know if everyone want to say something. I first anticipate that I think that Rosa denounced very well the bureaucratization of the parties, of the all, all the organization that took the power, and that's a, a real problem in the in, I think in the capitalist system. So it's very difficult to combat it, it. I don't think that it is really impossible, but yes, I think that is very, very difficult. And I think the, the ideas of Rosa are useful to uh, make a, a program of alliances of the worker class, the workers uh, in the big sense, uh, including uh, many groups, as Marina told in her presentation, that uh, sometimes are excluded uh, and they took only formal workers, but workers in the big sense of the world. And I think the alliances can, uh, if the alliances, uh, alliances are made from the basis, that is the way to uh, combat, uh, combat the bureaucracy. I don't know if someone of the panelists, our distinguished panelists, want to uh, add something or say something. Yes, I would like to say Hi. that some of these parties which talk about the, the workers are like apples. This was something very common in the 1920s in the Weimar Republic. They are like apples, red on the outside and white on the inside. Oh, yes. I, I would like to say, yeah, Marina. I, I don't think that there has been a left party that has uh, bureaucrat uh, that has had problems with bureaucratization, because in the first place, no uh, Chavism nor Kirchnerism in Argentina were left parties. They are parties that are uh, created from top down. Uh, from a political figure that has a previous history, uh, uh, Chavez and Kirchner 
were bourgeois politicians that in the middle of the crisis radicalized their discourse to co-opt part of the left and they, they shift to the right, but they were never leftists. They have a history. Uh, Chavez made a, a, an attempt. Chavez was a military and he made an, a, a, a state coup attempt before presenting himself to elections. Kirner was a govern, governor of, uh, in the time of Menem and Cavallo, a very liberal government. Then in the middle of the crisis, when people went out to the streets, the Argentinazo, Venezuela, Caracaso, those bourgeois politicians have the cunning of radicalized their discourse and former party trying to co-opt part of the left, but they were never leftists. And there is a question there for Marina and for myself. Can the US or European Union talk about human rights? No, the United States violates human rights in many places around the world. And the European Union, they close their eyes at the violation of human rights in the same European continent. So nobody can speak about human rights, either the United States, the European Union, Venezuela, or Russia. The governments can't speak about human rights, but workers, we can talk about workers' human rights. And I don't care about bourgeois human rights. I don't care about Guaido. He can rot in shame for me. I care about workers, socialist workers' human rights. And I, as long as, as any worker, of any part of the world can care about the human rights of another workers, but because that is what worker solidarity is about. If any socialist worker is in shame, is disappear, any worker of the world can talk about, can campaign for, because we are not divided in countries, we are divided in classes, and that's something of the most, most important legacy of Rose Luxembourg. Class is more important than nations. And we should not be divided by nations. We should be divided by classes. So I care for the rights of workers. I care for the rights of socialist workers in any place of the world because that is internationalism. And that is something that Rosa Luxembourg defended. Okay, I agree with the intervention of Thomas and, and Marina is that was, I, I talk about the, the importance of the, the concept of workers in, in, in the sense, not limited to uh, one group in the workers and uh, we faced and I think it's for another panel that the problem of of, of the left and the organization left uh, where is the left now when the left uh, lose their way Rosa denounced it uh, from the second international and the bureaucracy in the second international and it's very difficult to to find the, the left program uh, in our days uh, all around the world, I think. Uh, but we can leave this for, for another discussion. The time is sober. I, I have the, uh, to, I want to give my thanks uh, to our distinguished panelists, but also to the audience that accompany us uh, in the Facebook page and uh, for I'm grateful for all the comments, the questionings that they give to us. Uh, it's for all that I uh, recommend it to continue uh, connected. Uh, in a few minutes, it will be starting a new panel, a book launch entitled Creolizing Rosa Luxembourg. And I, 
I'm grateful. It's, it was a great honor for me to be here. So goodbye to all and continue enjoying the symposium. Bye-bye.